Now, um, you won't be surprised that um, as we begin our day together, uh, we're going to focus on uh, on scripture, on a, on a passage from, um, from the Psalms, in this case, Psalm 131. Um, the, the great Baptist um, minister, C.H. Spurgeon, uh, said about this psalm that it's one of the shortest to read, uh, but one of the longest to learn. He, he didn't mean uh, one of the longest to memorize, uh, one of the hardest, I should say, uh, to, 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 to learn. He didn't mean hardest to memorize. He meant um, uh, hardest to put into practice, hardest to, uh, to live by. Um, a, a little story for you. Um, many of you will have had some contact one way or another, uh, I guess, with my wonderful PA, Wendy Whitfield. Uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, Wendy became a grandma for the first time uh, following the safe arrival of Alfie Jasper, uh, weighing it at eight pounds and five um, ounces. Uh, the, the night after he had arrived, uh, my wife Kathy and I were saying night prayer Compline together as we try to do several times a week. And um, we take it in turns to lead that short um, service. And, and on this occasion, it fell to Kathy to um, sum up our day with um, some prayers of thanksgiving and, uh, and of intercession. And of course, uh, when it came to thanksgiving, Alfie was top of Kathy's list. Uh, but what she actually prayed was this. Thank you, loving God, for baby Alfie and for all the hope he has brought into the world. Thank you for all the hope he has brought uh, into the world. I realise that there are painful exceptions and I don't mean to ignore those, but, but on the whole, I think that is our experience. The birth of a new baby um, brings hope. One of my least favourite Christmas songs is the Johnny Mathis hit, uh, When a Child is Born. I, I particularly hate the line, it's all a dream, an illusion now. It must come true someday soon, somehow. Um, as a take on the significance of the birth of Jesus, that seems to me to be about, about as wide of the mark um, as you can possibly get. But it's no coincidence that the opening line of that song goes like this, a ray of hope flickers in the sky. The birth, the birth of a baby often has uh, that effect of, of flickering new hope um, into life. Now there's a picture which I'm hoping that um, Mike can bring onto the screen um, at this point. Now, uh, again, I, I realize that there are painful exceptions, but, but for most of us, this is an image to bring a smile uh, to our faces. That there are few images so full of love and joy, and yes, of hope, as that of a baby asleep on its mother's breast. Thanks, Mike. Our theme today is, is Lights for Christ Bringing Hope. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to develop our Lights for Christ community. Our diocesan vision is to mobilize the whole people of God for the whole mission uh, of God, enabling every baptized person to grow up to the fullness of their baptismal calling, to shine as lights for Christ in the world to the glory of God the Father. So this morning, I'm focusing on receiving the light of Christ. Then Ruth Valerio's talk will open up a vital aspect of walking in the light of Christ. And Bishop Sophie will speak at the end of the morning about reflecting the light of Christ. And to help us think about receiving the light of Christ, we're going to look together at Psalm 131, which Christine is now going to read for us. Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvellous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. There's one, one more verse, verse three, which finishes, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth uh, on and forevermore. So, so let's see what Psalm 131 might have to tell us about uh, receiving the light of Christ and about bringing, uh, bringing hope. Um, it's only a short psalm, but there are two definite parts to it. Uh, part one is longer. Part one takes up verses one and two, uh, the bits Christine read, and it's addressed as a prayer uh, to the Lord. Part two takes up verse three, that's the bit I added on, and it's addressed as an appeal uh, to Israel. So the psalm moves from a declaration of trust in the Lord to an appeal, an exhortation uh, of, uh, to hope in the Lord. It moves from the experience of an individual believer uh, to the responsibility of the whole 
um, people of, of God. Uh, I, I just want to spend a few minutes looking at each of those two parts. And um, since part one is the, uh, the longer part, I'm going to spend uh, the longer bit of my time on it. So first of all, then, uh, verses one and two. There's a three letter word in verse one used three times over, which makes all the difference to the first verse. And it's the little word not. Um, you, you'll realize that a, a sentence with the word not in it uh, is completely different from the same sentence with that word missing. You may um, have heard of uh, the um, so-called wicked edition of the Bible, sometimes called the adulterer's edition um, of the Bible, published by Robert Parker, um, uh, the, the, the King's printer um, in London in 1631. Um, either by accident or, or more likely by mischief, um, the word not was omitted from the seventh commandment um, so that it read, thou shalt commit adultery. Uh, the printer lost his license for that uh, and was fined a hefty sum. Uh, most of the printed copies were, um, uh, were destroyed, uh, but the result, uh, the result is that the few copies that are, are left are, are now worth a fortune. Uh, not is the key word uh, in verse one. Um, I don't think the psalmist is making a bold claim so much as setting out an aspiration about the way he or she wants to relate to God. Oh Lord, we read, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy uh, myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Uh, one commentator suggests that there's a reference there to the past, the present uh, and the future. The psalmist is aiming to avoid pride in relation to past achievements. My heart is not lifted up. Ambition in relation to future achievements. My eyes are not raised too high. My sights are not raised uh, too high. Um, and self-righteousness in relation to the present. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. And when C.H. Spurgeon said that this psalm is short to read but long to learn, um, he meant that that aspiration to avoid pride and selfish ambition and self-righteousness is brilliant, but it is very hard to do. Um, maybe it's especially hard in our culture, uh, which celebrates acquisition, it seems to me, and, and high achievers, um, and seems sometimes almost to encourage a sort of power-hungry, grasping arrogance. But as a matter of fact, this is just original sin. Where did Adam and Eve go wrong in the Garden of Eden, except that they did allow their hearts to be lifted up, their eyes to be raised too high? They, they did allow um, themselves to, to be occupied in things too great and too wonderful um, for them. And what that means is that if we are not aware of a struggle in this area, if you're not aware uh, of wrestling uh, with pride and, and ambition and self-righteousness, uh, then it's probably not because you're not in fact um, uh, faced with a problem in this area, but uh, that you haven't woken up entirely to how great your problem is or to put it more positively if you are aware of a problem here in your own life that's a good start you're in good company and welcome to the club welcome uh, to the human race so verse one is a fabulous aspiration an inspiring intention a proper spiritual goal but how do we go about it how can we foster true meekness of heart a humility of the eyes lowliness um, of the mind well listen to verse two i have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, my soul is like the weaned child that is within me. Obviously, it's, it's on account of, of this verse that I began with that photo and with that reference to baby Elfie. Actually, I'm not convinced that the New Revised Standard Version has the translation quite right here. Commentators are divided whether the crucial Hebrew word refers to a weaned child, a toddler, who returns to her mother's arms not to feed but just for a cuddle, or as in the image I shared with you earlier um, of a baby who sleeps on his mother's shoulder having fed at the breast. But either way, we get the point, whether the image is of a contented nursing infant who's just come off the breast at the end of a feeding, or a contented newly weaned child who's come off the breast for good but still returns to the mother's arms for a cuddle. The point is that the child is utterly secure, at peace, resting, on the source of its life. But notice this, what comes utterly naturally to a baby or a toddler, the psalmist is saying that he has done deliberately. I have calmed and quieted my soul to make it like a contented baby resting on my Lord. I want to suggest that right there is a key tip, a really helpful discipline, 
which can help each one of us receive the light of Christ day by day. If I may speak personally for a moment, there's a step I try to take most days as part of my morning routine, which is just to try to get still before the Lord. I think of it as a kind of spiritual sunbathing, but that idea might not appeal uh, to any of you who are not sun lovers in the way that I am. I, I just try to sit still for a few minutes, basking in the warmth of God's love, in his mercies, which are new every morning, and to allow all the churning that is inside me, in my soul, all the agitation and restlessness to which I'm prone every day to be calm and to be quieted. And it's a, it's a practice I commend to you. It is possible for our souls to be calm and to be quiet and to rest confidently and contentedly on our Lord because God is the sort of God God is. You may have heard me say before that when our English Bibles use the word Lord in capital letters, as in verse one, they do so to translate that Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, the personal name by which God made himself known to the Israelites and especially to Moses on Mount Sinai. What is God like? What is Yahweh, the Lord, like? He is, we're told in, verse, uh, in Exodus 34, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It is possible for our souls to be calm and quiet. It is possible for us to receive the light of Christ as we wait upon the Lord, because God is the sort of God God is. In your prayer times, I want to urge you to bask in the character of this God, a God gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's the first thing. More briefly, verse three. There's an abrupt change in the psalm here. There's a crunching of the gears. The psalmist is no longer pouring out his or her heart uh, to the Lord, not speaking to God at all anymore. Suddenly, the psalmist is speaking briefly and urgently to the community with these words. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. I want to say just two brief things about that final verse. The first is that in Hebrew, the word hope can actually be translated wait, which is a bit counterintuitive. Mostly, when we think we hope for something, we, we do it a bit impatiently, but in Hebrew, it is hope that enables someone to wait patiently, to play the long game, to persevere. Hoping is about waiting, but not waiting idly, about waiting on tiptoes expectantly. We hope for the coming of God's kingdom as we wait for it in prayer and in longing, but also actively working for the day when God's kingdom will come. And it is as we wait for God's kingdom that we are equipped daily to be people of hope. And despite the abrupt shift from verse two to verse three, there is a connection here. There, there must be somehow uh, that the psalmist jumped um, in his mind from his own experience to the responsibility of the people of God. And I think the connection is this. It is only as each one of us receives afresh the light of Christ each day that we can bring hope. It is only as each one of us receives the light of Christ, only as each one of us calms and quietens our own souls so that they are like a contented baby resting on the Lord, not grasping, not agitated, not prone to pride or ambition or self-righteousness, that each one of us can be a person of hope waiting for the Lord, waiting for the God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And it's as together, we wait upon this God, we hope in this God, that we can in turn, as the people of God, be bearers of hope in the world. A hope all too easily governed precisely by pride and ambition and self-righteousness. How, how our God, how our world, I should say, needs hope, how our world needs lights for Christ now, shining in the world to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now, if the technology will permit, we're going to um, break briefly into um, smaller groups. Uh, and there's a question that I want to ask you to talk over just for two or three minutes until a quarter past or a moment or so after that. Uh, and the question is this, what helps you to hope in God? What helps you to hope in God? If we're going to be people of hope, um, in the world, uh, we need to nurture that hope in ourselves and in one another. So as we break into groups, take that question with you. What helps you to hope in God?